this is, uh, I don't even know how to title this video. It's just insane. It's insane. I don't know what to make of it. I don't know what the future holds. I just, <laughs> I'm protecting my bottom line. I still have some stocks. Don't get me wrong. I just bought, uh, you know, I bought some uh, position of VTI yesterday. V I bought 20,000 of VTI. Um, well, I think it was 100 shares. I like round lot shares. And of course, the minute I bought, shoops, because I bought, dude. So you're all, you can blame me. All right, blame me. Anyway, so here we go. Uh, so one of my crack research team sent this to me. And this is from the Federal Reserve Board, not Peter Schiff or not some conspiracy theorist website. And I got crack research teams everywhere. So we're looking out for you. We're watching you, my friends. We're watching you. We got crack research teams everywhere. So don't step out of line. Mind your P's and Q's, all right? Anyway, so this crack research team uh, researcher, uh, because this person is recently retired, has the ability to dive deep into the mud that is our government and what they're writing. And it's very fun because um, this person is bringing me stuff that I would not have had the time to look at, but I find it very interesting. All right, so check this out. Un Again, did I already say this, what the dateline of this was? Dateline on this is April 2023, all right? So check this out. Unrealized losses are, are at high levels. Uh, high levels? Uh, historically? <laughs> what? <laughs> As interest rates rose in 2022, the market value of bank securities significantly declined, creating unrealized losses. They're, are, they're highest at the banks with long-duration securities. Okay. Banks reporting large unrealized losses may have limited ability to sell securities to fund loan demand or support any unanticipated deposit withdrawals without recognizing losses. Now, who knows what there could be runs on banks? I don't know. But they'll be unable to fund loan demand because they're so far down in the red because they, well, I'll show you here. Uh, right here. Industry investment in securities grew to nearly $6 trillion in the first quarter of 2022. Since then, deposits have declined for two consecutive quarters, raising concern about ongoing liquidity. Um, many banks invested funds from record deposit growth in longer duration to boost earnings. Look at this. I mean, look at this, dude. In 2020, right there, 69% of investment securities were, were greater than three years. And now in 2022 is 76%. So they stretch, they reached for yield. Look at that. I mean, investment securities on the left are at the amortized cost. So right here, we got deposits going through the roof, investment securities, all right? So they're keeping a little bit there, trillions of dollars over at investment securities. But here the investment securities are through the roof. So the question is, obviously, there's a lot of, a delta there, if that makes sense. So we have a lot of uh, cushion, you would think, other than the fact that if you're one of these guys right here, banks reporting large unrealized losses, you may have limited ability to sell securities to fund loans and support any anticipated deposit withdrawals without recognizing losses. I mean, I don't, look, dude, I have no clue. All I know is, uh, yeah, they reached for yield and now it's coming back to bite them in the butt. So let's keep reading here. Most banks are generally benefiting from the rising interest rates. Net interest margins are expanding. So remember, as I told you a million times, the, the primary source of revenue for a bank or profits is net interest income. They, they borrow from the Fed at three and they loan to you at five. That's a 2% net interest income. And that's your margin, essentially. Well, what are they borrowing from the Fed now? Uh, five and a half? And what are they loaning it to you? If, if even you're going to borrow. I mean, see, Don't you see how this is corrupted? They're going to borrow from the Fed at five and a half. What, I don't even know what it is. What are the Fed funds rate? Five. I don't care. All right. Well, we're going to get that back when, the, when we loan to some guy. You know how many homes are on the market right now? Not very many. The listings is like, I don't know, like 300,000. I can't remember. So very, very little, which means there's not a lot of people a selling their homes and not a lot of people buying their homes either. And if there's not a lot of people buying their homes, there's not a lot of people borrowing in which to buy their home. Right, and a lot of people are are sitting as I am. Well, I mean, I still got kids in school, but I'm sitting there. I'm saying, look, I got a pretty low interest rate. I'm going to sit tight. I'm not going to sell. This was happening all across the United States. So the industry in real estate is shoosh. I mean, there's still people doing it, but not to the extent that there's going to be a huge demand for loans. How many people are actually borrowing to fund businesses, startups? To, I mean, how many businesses are actually borrowing? Well, now you got a higher interest rate that you got to pay to borrow anyway, and if it's non-collateralized, it's going to be way high. How many businesses are going to do that? Other than the, 
a lot of risky businesses. You see what I'm saying? Because they're saying, I need the money. I need the cash flow. I, I need I need to have the money to pay my my current account deficit, things of this nature. Working capital. All right. All right. So I'm going to pay, you know, so the bank will loan to me at eight. And I'm, you know, whether the bank is getting their money at five and a half or whatever it is. Yeah, I might not do that. I might just, uh, I might just tap into my other assets, i.e. equity. In my home, I might tap into uh, my my equities, my my securities, essentially. I don't know. I just know this is friggin' insanity. So anyway, so that's how typically banks work. You know, they borrow at three and they lend at five. Well, now they're borrowing at five. They're lending at, well, is there going to be a huge demand for loans? I'm not trying to borrow any money. I'll tell you that right now. You probably aren't either. If that were, if I'm typical of the average Americana, that means there's a lot less lending being done, which means the banks are loaning, borrowing from the Fed at five and a half. They're not going to be able to recoup that in lending. All right. Uh, rising interest rates create significant unrealized losses in investment securities, and in some cases, depressing tangible equity. As interest rates increase, banks with large market value losses could experience increasing risks. I mean, this is crazy. Unrealized Losses are highest at banks with long duration securities. Yep. I, <laughs> 722 banks reported unrealized losses exceeding 50% of their capital. I mean, a growing number reported unrealized losses that threatened capital. 31 of these banks report negative tangible equity. Do we know what the banks are? Banks reporting uh, negative tangible equity are currently not able to borrow money from federal home loan banks to actually lend for mortgages and may lose the ability to sell government sponsored enterprise. Uh, do we know what these 31 banks are? Some banks are taking action to shelter further market losses, including changing the accounting treatment of their securities. That's always good. Thus, their intent is to use securities for liquidity purpose. Always good to change accounting. That, that's, that's legit. Uh, okay. Hedging their interest rate risk. How? How are you hedging it? We're going to you know, buy some puts or whatever it is. We're going to, okay, well, where's that cash flow coming from to do that? Retaining more tangible equity. I mean, all this sounds good in theory. Yeah, we're going to hedge our risk. You're already negative tangible equity. The decision around such action is complex, particularly at smaller banks where securities have always been used for liquidity purposes and expertise of the hedging is limited. And what do you, you got to, hedging isn't free, man. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you could do some strangle or something with that option. And what happens when it goes kaput? Your goose is cooked, man. Banks with large unrealized losses face significant safety and soundness risks. Securities have traditionally been used for liquidity purposes. Today, the level of unrealized losses are come, causing some banks to face, face tough choices. Ben! As a... Higher le- banks with higher levels of unrealized losses are funding loan growth and deposit withdrawal with, with other more highly liquid assets and borrowings. How? What? What? Selling stocks? Don't you see how the pressure on, on, your, on your securities from the banks who are trying to loan? Again, I don't know how this is going to shake out. I'm just saying, don't you see what? It, it seems pretty obvious to me that the pressure, if these banks got to liquidate stuff to get the money to lend, well, they're liquidating it. You know, at least the equities right now are higher than they were in October. I gotta let this dog out. But the bonds are still. I mean, the, the bonds are the worst bond market we've ever had, man. The worst bond market we ever had last year. It's insanity. So you're you, now at the end of you at the end of the day, as I've said a million times a Sunday here, we're still way up from where we were five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. We're still way up, and that means these banks too. The question is, can they just go and sell a bunch of stocks to fund loans? I, I don't know how that works. Banks may need to cur- curtail future lending activity. That's the issue due to limited funding options. Banks will face difficulty liquidating, liquidating securities without realized losses. All right. um, holding securities with below market yields while funding costs increase negatively impacts net interest margins. That's what I'm saying. So they're holding securities... <laughs> You know, at two and three percent, while funding costs, they're borrowing at five. This is the the reverse of net interest income. They're saying, I'm going to borrow from you at five and a half. I only got three percent of my interest I'm getting here. But don't worry, the Federal Reserve's in charge. So check this out. So I went to Instapundit today. I'm a big fan of Instapundit. I've been reading these guys for years and years and years. And years. Instapundit's a big, uh, he, he, he believes the V, not uh, just these big guys believes the V. And of course, he believes you know, NASA 
and uh, the spaces and all that. So he, he was a typical guy, you know what I'm saying? I believe what the science says. And look, I, I, I'm giving him some, some gruff here, but he very big guy on the Vs and very big guys on uh, any kind of space agency. I believe what they say because, you know, people want to. Anyway, so check this out. U.S. interest payment is now equal to total defense spending. And 30% of the debt is to be refinanced the next 12 months at a significantly higher rates. And how long are we refinancing the debt for? If we're refinancing on the short term, those rates are high. In the long term, it's still quite low. I mean, the 10-year treasury is at 3.448. Anyway, this just shows you that the rates can't go up much higher. I just, I'm convinced that. Anyway, the point being is, the point being is because interest rates can't go up, it just can't. Man. I was reading someplace yesterday. I can't remember I saw this. The same along the same lines. That if interest rates go one percent point higher, uh, the U.S. Is essentially insolvent, just because we don't have the money. Uh, we don't have the money for any of this stuff. I grant you, but still, it'd be like the debt payment would be the number one line item to include Medicare, to include uh, Social Security, to include defense budgeting, all that. The debt payment, if the interest rates went up like one percent, I can't remember what it was. They just don't, there's no more interest rate increases, in my opinion. I, I just don't know. I mean, anything could happen, but man, it's risky out there, dudes. Um, anyway, my man, um, John just emailed me the other day. He's like, Josh, how come my portfolio in retirement is, uh, I think it was like his 88% in a growth portfolio, but it's 95% in a more conservative portfolio in terms of his probability of, of success, you know, running out of money. Again, we're trying to shoot for about 85%. That's what we're trying to shoot for. If it's, up, if it's above 90, you're not spending enough. If it's below 80, you're probably spending too much. Anyway, so uh, I, I told him, I said, well, I, I quizzed him back. I asked, a, I answered his question with a question. Just look into it deeper. And I said, you know, because I gave him some ideas to think about. And the reason was he took risk off the table. All right, so he, if he went to a more conservative portfolio, it increases his probability of success, but it does decrease his potential for leaving a higher legacy at his death. And that's not his big concern. So he's like, yeah, okay. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, you're taking risk off the table now. That means there's going to be less growth for future generations that you might want to leave money to, i.e. you're going to leave less money to them, but you do decrease your downside risk because of standard deviations and whatnot. And we're getting a higher interest rate as well. Um, whereas, you know, a year ago we weren't. We just weren't. Dude. I mean, so now we're getting 4 and 5% on short, safe money. A year ago, we were getting you know a quarter of a percent. You see what I'm saying? So it's kind of like, well, you know, risk versus reward. Do you want the reward of leaving more money potentially to your kids with a risk of downside, or do you want the uh, to take some risk off and uh, still leave a uh, sizable amount to your kids, but just could potentially could be lower? The risk is there; it's not going away. And I, uh, I just, <laughs> I'm just uh, okay. I mean, do what you got to do. But I'm sitting there thinking. So anyway, he emailed me so so that. I can't tell him what to do, but he can put two and two together. If you've won the game, stop playing. Take the risk off the table, man. It doesn't make sense. I mean, who knows what's going to happen to banks? I mean, everyone says they, no one knows anything. I mean, my goodness. You know, we could be on a boom. I don't know. But I'm just sitting there thinking, did you see this right here? I didn't make this up. This right here. I, I, that's not unrealized gain i mean something we've already lost it what's up pac west is it called pac west is that what's called today i mean i guess you could do like what uh the rothschild said when blood's in the street buy stocks pac west yeah so you could go not right now go nuts look at that pac west and this right here would be what we call a dead cat bounce by the way see that i mean but you only know after the fact you don't know before that's a dead cat bounce it fell off the Empire State Building and it bounced a little bit and then it's falling again. So if you're, if you were, <laughs> I wouldn't do it, but if you were a, uh, a gutsy investor, you'd be buying that stock right now because there's money to be made when blood's in the street and that's blood right there. Look, the yield on PacWest is down to 0.66, even though the dividend, uh, even though the price has gone down from 52 to basically four. That's nuts, dudes. This was trading at, it basically 60 just like what two years ago 50 so yeah it's trading at let's see here it doesn't say anyway so it's trading uh at two years ago no 2022 less than two years trading at 55 crazy in 2018 is trading at yeah about 60 and now it's down to four and a half 
and it has no PE ratio, has no earnings, and it pays hardly any dividend anymore, even though it is a bank, and even though the yield and even the price is down, that yield should be through the roof, but it ain't there. Meh. Let's see what Schwab's doing. I know a lot of you guys are concerned about Schwab. Me too. I'm not. Yeah, Schwab's up. Okay. That's good. I'm not all that worried about Schwab. But from a bank perspective, I don't know what's going on there. But from a invest, it doesn't matter because if Schwab goes under, it's not like your portfolio is gone with it. I mean, it's not. And this is SIPC, S I P C, the uh, Securities Investment Protection Company, Corporate, whatever it's called. That's for fraud and things. Um, but if, if, this, if, if my VTI, all right, if Schwab goes under and I still own VT and I own VTI, VTI doesn't go under. VTI is just sitting there. It'll be transferred to another firm that buys out Schwab. This, that's just how it happens. I'm not worried about Schwab going bankrupt, taking my money with them. Now, the bank on the other hand, I don't know. But Schwab, yeah, look at that, dude. It's, uh, two years ago, Schwab was trading at 96, and now it's at 48. And it's, you know, it's, oh, shoot, not two years ago. Within the last year, Schwab was trading at, 85 and now it's at freaking 48 so i mean <laughs> you gotta protect the downside man it's uh it's scary out there i'm just trying to see what's uh amazon doing I just because these tech stocks that's yeah, down a little bit all right yeah that's i would not buy amazon save my life what's apple doing because apple's a golden boy right for many people yeah, look at apple still and still looking i mean anyway who knows protect the downside no. love your thoughts don't forget to subscribe and uh my my i gotta keep saying this dude my uh retirement planning course is still on. i gotta say on the front end of the video <laughs> still i'm not good at marketing we're still on sale for the next week and just use promo code tax promo code tax we'll see you